Right, welcome everyone to today's Title Topics webinar. These are ALTA's free presentations we offer every month on issues important to title professionals. If uh, you're here, you uh, must have fell for a phishing scheme and this isn't really a webinar. Uh, we're, you're, you'll now sit through an hour long uh, training session as we uh, uh, work on emptying your escrow, escrow accounts. No, just, just kidding, it's just a little icebreaker there, but, but maybe not far, far fetched on, on how uh, some of these fraudsters uh, go about collecting info uh, from their targets. Uh, I'm Jeremy Yoey, Alta's Vice President of Communications, and uh, we've got a great webinar lined up today to uh, discuss the latest uh, wire fraud trends, techniques often, often used to, uh, to launch these, these fraud attacks and, and some best practices at the end of the pre presentation to uh, help keep your organization and your clients as safe as possible. Uh, before starting, I just need to quickly touch on a few housekeeping items. A copy of today's presentation was emailed earlier to today to all registrants. You can also download a PDF from the uh, GoToWebinar window pane on your screen. Uh, if you're not logged in to the computer and you didn't get my email, uh, you can shoot, shoot me an email uh, at jyohe at alta.org. That's j-y-o-h-e at alta.org. And I can send you a copy at the conclusion of today's webinar. Uh, all participant lines are muted. Uh, if at any time you have a question, use, uh, uh, you can submit them through the questions box. We will hold some time at the, a at the end for Q&A. As an added benefit, the uh, presentation is being recorded. After we've processed it, the recording will be available on uh, Alta's website at alta.org forward slash title topics. And you also actually get an email with a link to, directly to the recording. I need to thank Fidelity National Title Group for sponsoring our title topics webinars this year. Uh, their support allows us to continue providing these uh, educational opportunities free of charge. And uh, with that out of the way, let me uh, briefly introduce today's speak speakers. Uh, first, we have Dama Brown. Uh, Dama is a regional director at the Federal Trade Commission. And next we have Tom Cronkright. Tom is co-founder of Sun Title Agency in Michigan. And uh, he is also the uh, co-founder of Certified, a software company that works to prevent wire fraud. And we also have Ken Robb. Ken is a cybersecurity risk consultant at Citadel Cyber Solutions. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And, and Dama, I'll, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks so much, Jeremy, and, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. We've got a lot of material to cover, so I think we'll just dive right in and we'll talk about the changing uh, face of fraud. Uh, Tom is uh, handling the slide advances for me, so periodically you'll hear me ask him to forward the slide. Uh, Fraud's nothing new. I think you guys are all familiar. Uh, criminals have always found opportunities to defraud people through every means available to them. So it's shown up as counterfeit checks or payment instruments, whale, uh, mail or uh, stock and land swindles. There's really uh, limitless opportunities for profiting by deceiving or tricking other people. Uh, today we're gonna talk about cyber frauds and we're considering those to be any scheme that is a deliberate deception for unfair or unlawful gain that occurs either online or using the internet. And in today's real estate and title industries, uh, wire fraud is probably one of the most common types of cyber fraud. And it's hitting these industries very hard and, and industry members really need to be on guard and be wary of these. Uh, we're gonna be talking about wire and cyber frauds why the frauds are prevalent in your industry, some ideas for minimizing your risk for falling prey to these scams, and also tips for complying with the legal requirements that are imposed on businesses for keeping data safe. And then we'll examine a, a real world example of, of how these frauds occur and how they can hurt your business. So wire fraud uh, is the fastest growing cyber crime in the, in the US. In the fiscal year uh, 2017, the FBI reported that nearly $1 billion was diverted or attempted to be diverted from real estate uh, purchase transactions and wired to criminal, inter criminal, criminal enterprises. Uh, and that figure was substantially higher than the prior fiscal year where the FBI counted just $19 million in wire transfer frauds that were affecting home buyers. Uh, the FBI cites wire fraud and, in particular, business email compromise scams as the fastest growing crime in the world. And, and these are affecting businesses large and small, causing billions of dollars of losses 
and we're getting uh, there's complaints being filed you know across the nation and really all across the world a business email compromise we'll talk about a little bit and and that's a scam where an attacker gains access to a corporate email account either by hacking or somehow obtaining the credentials and then spoofs the owner's identity in order to defraud the company or its employees its customers or uh, its partners of money or information. Um, just this week, the Department of Justice announced the arrest of 74 defendants in a, a joint law enforcement uh, task force to stop uh, primarily business email compromise schemes that were targeting real estate lawyers and title companies. And that those arrests resulted in the seizure of $2.4 million and actually the suspension and recovery of about $14 million in fraudulent wire transfers. So this is a, a scam that's very, very common and law enforcement is very aggressive in trying to address them, but it's something that uh, businesses need to be wary of. Uh, and, and we have a statistic here, actually this is some figures that Tom pulled from the FBI, uh, between 2015 and 17 wire fraud in real estate transactions particularly increased over 1100% uh, and the reported losses over 2500%. Uh, According to a report that was released just this May, May um, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center saw over 300,000 consumers report cyber fraud and malware attacks last year. And the losses from those scams exceeded uh, $1.4 billion. The top threats included phishing and ransomware scams and, and business email compromise scams, um, alongside with some tech support and other types of, of extortion or scam. Uh, however, the vast majority of those complaints did stem from business email compromise and over 15,000 individuals were affected by those scams, and they uh, accounted for losses of over $875 million. If you can move to the next slide, um, Tom. You can see this is just, just a very, very small snippet or timeline of, of some of the uh, reported frauds from, from last year. And they're, you know, throughout the country, you know, there's not a place that, that is not vulnerable to these types of scams. And here we have a quote from Jessica Edgerton, uh, Ed Edgerton sorry, uh, who's an associate counsel for the National Association of Realtors in Chicago. And she said, you know, it's unbelievable how often this is happening. And I'm going to turn it next Tom, to, to Tom to, to address that, that issue. Oh, Dama, thank you. And I, but before I forget to mention it, the, the, the cyber criminal roundup that took place earlier or announced earlier this week, um, our, you know, we were hit with a fraud uh, in 2015 that cost our title agency 180 grand. And as I was reading through that announcement, um, the the first syndicate that they mentioned was the Southern Florida syndicate, and and we were deeply involved with those uh, those very bad people that had taken our money, and and we we pressed them hard through our civil litigation to get it back. So um, a lot of times, this seems like it's it's nameless and faceless and it's out there in the distance. I can tell you, uh, I can tell you right now that, uh, that if you go through it, you know, that is absolutely not the case. So I'm, I'm, as I'm reading that announcement, I'm, I'm, I'm running back and rolling the tapes in my mind of, of that whole recovery effort from those people. So, uh, so I want to quickly set up, uh, just why real estate transactions. I'm going to quickly go through a minute by minute, uh, dissection of a fraud and then speak to, uh, the legal landscape and how our liability is frankly changing as participants in the transaction ecosystem. So real estate's unique for, for three main reasons. Um, it's incredibly lucrative among many other types of crimes or theft. So your average robbery is less than 800 bank robberies now. You don't even hear about them uh, very much, uh, but then your wire fraud your wire fraud could be, you know, life changing to someone in a third world country um, or these these dark enterprises that are that are after us. And and even wire fraud in real estate is even much higher, closer to uh, 180 to 200,000. But this is probably one of the most interesting things in the sense that if we take a step back, uh, we've all distanced ourselves on how we communicate uh, by communicating electronically and through text messaging and and it, with 
an average of seven transaction participants per real estate uh, closing or per real estate deal. And then you layer in this, this phenomenon of split closings and the distance that that adds to each other. Uh, we're, there's a lot of degrees of separation and they know that. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about real estate is you know when the transaction's taking place. Unlike any other transaction profile in the United States, if I'm listing a house, it syndicates within 48 hours, a pending syndicates, and you're able to find everything you need to start the fraud in just a few seconds. So uh, I think those attributes, you know, the, the profile, the size of the prize, the, the, uh, the fragmentation of the market, and frankly, the, the ability to, to have 40 days after I've got all the information to hatch a fraud and trick somebody, uh, that that's unique to us. So Ken, if you don't mind, I'm going to pass it over to you and, and just start to maybe layer in how these frauds, how these frauds get started. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, I think one of the, one of the first things we need to focus on is how we communicate, as Tom said, how do we communicate within the ecosphere of our transaction? Um, and phishing, whaling, CFO fraud, those are all mechanisms where someone tries to take control of the communication going back and forth amongst the participants to um, elicit a response from anyone in the transaction to insert themselves to gain access to that transaction or to the information contained in the transaction. So um, Tom, if we go to the next slide. The, the cyber crime that we're talking about particularly here when it, when it comes to phishing isn't just relegated to wire fraud. Um, phishing is a, is a very broad term for someone trying to either steal credentials, access credit card information, or in this case, um, insert themselves in a transaction to abscond with funds. So phishing, and, and the reason why it's, it's so large of a percentage is because it's very, very successful and it's very, very low cost and it's low touch. In fact, um, most of the time when you're being phished, it's not somebody coming after you directly, you're just being hit by spam. It's coming out, it's gonna come into your inbox, and then once they can see that they can, that you'll respond to that, they may take the next step of coming at you directly um, because they know you you have someone or someone in your environment that's willing to um, be taken by these, these types of uh, phishing attacks. So if you can go to the next slide. So what's on the screen right now, and I, we should all be familiar with these because we see this, this is, this is a fairly egregious one, but uh, this is where the, the, it all started with, with these types of emails going out um, about these, uh, you know, largely originating in Nigeria, and you've, we should have all heard of the uh, Nigerian email scams, but this is an example of one. It's very, it's very apparent um, in this email, when you look at the subjects, um, you look at the from and to, and you look at the context of the, the email, any one of us could look at this today and say, how would anybody fall for this? But it was rampant and people did uh, because we built this cultural trust in communication. We brought over what we took from, say, regular email and faxes and things of that nature in our communication mechanism, brought this into our world and trusted those communications, had no reason to believe that someone would do this. However, what we did in anything we do in terms of making things easier, we also make it more ripe for fraud. Next slide, please. Once, once now we've, you know, we've added phishing into it. So that's a problem we have to deal with. On top of all the spam we get, um, now what's happening is that we're also being inundated with malicious attachments. So um, as, as this graph shows that those malicious attachments are trying to take the attack to the next level. So it's one thing for me to insert myself in the transaction and make, make off with funds and you never hear from me again. But some of the more sophisticated actors, um, are, they're interested in that money, but they're also interested in more. So if I can attach something to that email, make, 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 make sure it seems like it came internally, it came from a trusted vendor, or if it came from one of your clients, 
it's it, it it gives them the ability to gain access to your environment and sit there and wait and look so if i was going to attack an environment in a real estate transaction i would say oh it was great that i was able to get that one transaction what if i could sit in the environment and i could abscond with uh, account numbers brokerage account numbers i could steal loan information i can do a lot more damage with that so the malicious attachments are starting to become more and more prevalent because it's more lucrative. So the first wave of just being able to abscond with say 182,000, which is a great haul for a cyber criminal, by, by infiltrating your network, by infiltrating all the systems in your environment, they can sit there and wait. They can, the, I think the latest stat I saw was um, 101 days was how long an individual can sit on your network before uh, they were detected. And that detection's only coming after um, a breach happens. And I, I think we're all familiar with the word breach in terms of a da data being exfiltrated from environments. Breach also means that somebody has accessed your world and is, is absconding with information that they find valuable. So the next slide here, we have Gmail fishes. Um, it, this 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 is where the phishing becomes um, a little more sophisticated. So fake invoices, C, which is typically called CFO fraud, where you would receive an email about an invoice that was due or some some something is due that needs done immediately and I can't get to it, please execute on this. So if this comes from a, a trusted vendor and they send you invoices via PDF, you're more likely to click on it. Um, it'll open up, you'll see, you won't see anything happen, but it'll be executing in the background and malicious a payload has been um, added to your environment. So we have to not only be aware of the things that are egregiously um, uh, phishing attacks, but things that are, are masking themselves as valid emails as well. So uh, credential masking, this is also one of those payload type of attacks where I'm, I'm emailing you and I'm asking you to provide credentials. So please sign into a site, please sign into Google, please sign into your online banking, please sign into something so that um, we can resolve a particular issue or we can help you in the transaction. If I insert myself into the middle of your transaction, this may seem more plausible as well. So oftentimes users are, they're so busy, I get in, it says, oh, Google account credential, I need to go in, I need to access something, I gotta get into my Google Drive or DocuSign that I use and I pass off my username and password, which is going to be captured by someone on the, on the backside. And it's then going to take you to your Google site and it's gonna seem like you didn't log in, you're gonna try again and you're not gonna notice much of anything going on other than someone's now just absconded with um, username and password for a variety of different sites that you, that you may have given to them. So next slide. Um, another good example uh, of cloud services. We're all using cloud services now and they're aware of that. So Dropbox, Microsoft, uh, Amazon emails that come and say, you know, something, something has happened, a file's been uploaded, a client has dropped an invoice somewhere. Um, you know, whatever the case may be, they're becoming very sophisticated in terms of being able to mimic uh, specific uh, cloud services. So this also is another layer and another way they, they can attack you um, and gain access to your environments and not only your on-premise information, but your cloud, cloud information as well. So account takeover, I think this is, um, this is something that is, is a very complex thing to do uh, when you're attacking an environment. However, when an environment is um, not defended, and I, I, I always like to use uh, a quote that um, uh, from The Art of War by Sun Tzu, and, it's, and, and it goes like this. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. So I've often heard people say, I'm too small for them to care about. What you need to think about is they care about you because you're small, because you're undefended. Attacking the large financial institutions is very complex and very difficult. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money to break into those environments. An individual can break into a small business environment very quickly. So they're going after and they're specifically targeting the undefended environments because they're easier to break into. So, so I, think that's, I think that's it, Dom, um, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, Ken, Ken, thank you. And I want to, guys, I want to quick, quickly walk through in real time how a fraud, uh, how a fraud takes place. 
so to set the table a little bit, uh, this was a fraud attempt uh, that was uh, on one of our buyer customers in the fall of 16. And it led to a buyer standing in a credit union branch uh, here in West Michigan, holding fake Sun Title wiring information. How does that happen? Because it's the first time that we had seen it. And unfortunately, this was one of the main fraud profiles that they were able to, to really execute on successfully last year, uh, which led to a majority of that billion dollar loss that Dama had mentioned earlier. So I'm gonna move through this rather quickly. Uh, what's interesting is we're on the buyer side now, and this is, you know, to, to Ken's point, we have 150 things in our workflow that we have to be concerned about. And the lenders have about the same amount of, of items. They have, cyber criminals have one item in their workflow, and that's stealing your money or stealing our customers' money or gaining data and reselling it. But, but in wire fraud, they're prime, that's their only focus. So the way this is set up, uh, and I masked this for identity purposes, but the buyer's, e the, the buyer's agent clicks on a phishing lure and she gives account credentials and the fraudster gains access to her Gmail account and was actually in her account almost 100 days before they show up on October 17th. So when you see emails from the buyer's agent here, it's actually her account. So first email comes over at nine o'clock local time and it's a request to send the buyer our wiring information. What's interesting is in that email, we didn't get the buyer's real, uh, real email address. They created a spoofed identity for the buyer. And then from that spoofed identity, just a few minutes later, we receive a message saying, hey, could you send me your wiring information? So they're, they're, they're tying the communication loop that we're sending it to the right email. So that's what we do. At 9.15, we send the wiring information to the, what we think is the buyer, but it's actually a, a, face, a false identity. And then we copy in the agent. And because the, this is how sinister they are, because they had access to the agent's account in real time, and they knew that the agent had access to her account in real time through her mobile device, they would immediately delete and remove from any trash or history that the email took place. Then they spoof us. And what they did, this looks, this email address looks the same, but what they did, you notice on the, the word title error, they swapped out an L for an I. So they created a fake Sun Title domain. They registered the domain name, they created this very much uh, employee looking email account. And then from that fake identity, they send to the real buyer fraudulent wiring information. They copy the agent's account to make the buyer feel comfortable that the agent's in the loop and then they delete that email. So now the first communication of that morning to the buyer are the fraudulent wiring instructions. And then they do two of the most brilliant things, frankly, from a social engineering perspective, is they send an email back to my employee from the fake buyer account that says, hey, I got your email instructions from 9.15, I'm gonna head down to the bank, thank you, see you tomorrow morning. And then they do the same thing to the real buyer from the agent's account saying, hey, did you see the wiring instructions from 939? Make sure you head down before three o'clock so that the wire will post. We're a table funded state here and this was funding that next morning at nine o'clock. So he does that, he heads down to the bank and to make a long story short, except for the slightest nuance that a teller noticed in the email it wasn't even a misspell it was more one of these gut level things that teller asked the buyer to step out in the lobby and confirm before she set up and released the wire so we received the first communication of the day directly from the buyer to my employee just before two o'clock while he's actually in branch so this is the problem is that we have a fraud that is set up, you know, three months in advance as they're monitoring and they're looking at this information, but the velocity of the actual fraud is only 41 minutes of real time. This is what we're up against as an industry right now. 
So I also want to go into this idea of, of recovery and, um, and in particular, the, the, the best practices we're using. So right now we have the phone number, we've got a, a driver's license, and we have E&O. Uh, the challenge with the phone, and I'm not suggesting it is not a good best practice, I don't want people to, to misunderstand me, it's just we have to do a really good job confirming that we are calling the right number and that number hasn't been compromised. Uh, there has been many reports that have come out recently that they're actually porting calls, they're diverting calls to what are called ported phones or, or diverted numbers so that you think you're calling a seller that you haven't met in person and you can't verify their voice, uh, but you may have uh, somebody working for the fraudster actually pick up the phone and, and give you all the information they need. Same with text messaging. Uh, they, there's use cases now or, or, or fraud examples where they're actually creating fake identities and they're creating you know, and funding mortgages, purporting to be the property owner. Uh, they're stealing property by entering into contracts. They're showing up to closing with the identity of uh, who the property owner would be, especially on the corporate side. The black hole right now we have from a security perspective for corporations that are owning property and the ability to really confirm authority. And then E&O, guys, is a jump ball. Believe me, I buy every shred of insurance I can get. I check every single box. But there's a gray area between our E&O policies and our cyber policies, even with the social engineering and phishing and third-party loss and cyber. I could go on and on with all the riders out there right now because we're talking about a third party that got tricked. It wasn't our database that got hacked. It wasn't our funds that got pushed out from our bank account. That's clearly covered in these policies. But how does the underwriter address the unknown consumer that got tricked by their email? So, and then the other thing, I'll go through this quickly, is we have some seminal cases that are pending right now around the country that that are going to resolve, a, I guess, a, a simple thing in our industry, and that's do we share in the liability when there's a loss to someone in the transaction ecosystem, even if that someone isn't our customer? And I'm addressing the split closing issue, for example. So these cases, Wisconsin in, in the theme, so I'm a recovering lawyer, I'll put my, my legal hat on for a second, these themes of, of a heightened sense of duty of care and foreseeability, that is just octane for a plaintiff's bar uh, because we know how big the problem is. And what these key cases are saying is we have to do everything possible to notify the customer that this is out there. And we have to get in front of the communication and awareness of what's going to happen. So, you know, duties to safeguard and deliver wiring instructions. So these, these quotes are coming directly out of pleadings that I had pulled from the courthouses. So these aren't court decisions yet, but the, this is how the, the, the plaintiff's lawyers are pleading these cases. Many of you are aware of this. Uh, this was kind of the, the landmark case in Colorado where the retired couple wires almost 300,000 for, uh, for their dream home and their retirement home. And, uh, and they lost it. They wired to a fraudulent title company and they basically sued everyone in the transaction under this idea that, look, I don't know who's responsible for communicating this information, but NAR has bulletins, Alta has bulletins, the MBA has bulletins, everybody had bulletins, but it didn't trickle down into the hands of my client, the consumer. Uh, New York uh, fiduciary duties. I mean, these are all heightened senses, heightened states of of liability. And, and like I say, I'm going to hand this over in one second to Dama. I, I would strongly encourage because we've had to go through this practice ourselves as we continue to fight fraud every single week and month. And we're not a target as more than anyone else on the call is right now. Um, is that we, we need to take this on. I think the title industry in particular can step up and protect the ecosystem at a higher level. After all, we've asked for the money, the two trillion that comes into our escrow accounts each year, we've asked for that. And we've asked to be the custodian and the steward of that money going back out. 
Um, but if we think we have a problem now, fast forward again to e-closings and this, this true distance on how the transaction takes place. And, and I think, um, I think we'll, we're not going to be for the better. Um, so we, we've got to take this on. Dama, I'm going to hand it over to you now. And so that was all the bad guys. Now we're going to pivot to some practical things that we can do that you guys can take away to make your enterprises more secure and frankly protect the the customers that you have the privilege of serving. So, Damien, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, as as Tom said, and and I'm going to provide some information that both will hopefully protect your businesses from potentially being victimized by cyber frauds, but then also avoid the uh, compounded problem that, God forbid, you be uh, victimized by a hack and then have a follow-up visit by a state or federal regulator telling you that you failed to adopt reasonable security measures and therefore you are now liable for um, contributing to that breach. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the Federal Trade Commission's role in, in privacy and data security issues. Uh, the FTC is a law enforcement agency and we are t our, our primary task is really to protect consumers from, from unfair or deceptive acts or practices across really broad sectors of the US economy and it is just one of the many many state and federal regulators that have some authority over businesses um, collection of data and, and their data security practices so here we have a list of, of the FTC's authorities it includes section 5 and a number of, of the more specific sector laws and, and all of the ones listed there have some measure of data security or privacy requirements contained in them. Uh, to date, the commission has brought over 500 enforcement actions to protect the privacy of, of consumer data. We've also brought enforcement actions on, on a number of privacy issues, including uh, more than 130 spam and spyware cases, and uh, 50, uh, more than 50 different cases that just had general implications about data security or privacy. And so this is an area that the FTC has been involved in and active in for a long time. And if we can move to the next slide, I'll highlight some of the, um, the FTC's guiding principles when it looks at data security and privacy issues. And that is first and foremost that we want businesses to create what we call a culture of compliance. And that is uh, protecting sensitive data and information is everybody's responsibility in an organization. Um, second, because of technology advances and new threats, data security is always an ongoing process. This isn't something that you can finish you know, one week and you're done for the year. You're always gonna be examining your data collection and security practices and, and updating and revising them. Uh, and then third, we review data, uh, we, we, we review businesses' data security practices and their procedures, uh, applying what's called a, a standard of reasonableness. So we're not expecting perfection from businesses, but we do expect businesses to undertake a thoughtful analysis um, that, that takes into account the size of their business, the scope of the data that they're collecting, how sensitive da that data is, and what are the best means uh, for addressing potential risks. And then finally, uh, one of the other principles is really just, and it ties into the, the one above, and, and that is that because of the reasonable standard, um, the, the fact that a business is, is breached or hacked is not proof of a law violation, but the counterpoint to that is that the lack of a breach or a hack is not proof that a company used reasonable security practices. Instead, you know, independent of what, what uh, third-party actors did, we assess the, the business's own, own practices for under the reasonableness standard. Uh, so if we can move next to the next slide. I'm gonna be talking about the FTC start with security materials. And, and we have a number of resources that are available for business, uh, businesses at, at our business Center, which is at ftc.gov. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to have a list of resources and websites uh, that I hope that you'll visit and look at some of the tools there. Uh, but for now, we're going to go through the Start with Security. It's a guide for businesses that we published. And it's drawn from the, the law enforcement actions that we've brought. We've kind of distilled all of our cases into kind of 10 broad lessons for businesses about what the expectations for handling data securely include. I'm going to only have time to go over the high notes today. Um, the, the, guide, uh, the guide booklet has a lot more information, and I hope that you'll uh, have an opportunity to look at it and, and uh, read it more thoroughly at a later time. So the first one there is start with security. And to us, 
that means that businesses need to factor in security into all of their decision making in all of their business uh, departments across the organization. They need to collect and hold sensitive information only as they need it and only for as long as they need it. So I mentioned this is lessons learned, and so we're, I'll talk about some of the cases that we brought. And in and, and related to this tip, uh, the FTC had brought a case against a company called BJ's Wholesale Club. And that defendant had collected customer credit card information and, in, and had stored it for more than 30 days after a sale. And this actually violated their uh, merchant rules, their bank rules about how long they were to keep customers' information. Uh, and unsurprisingly, when hackers were able to exploit another weakness in their security practices, uh, they immediately were able to steal and, and use that credit card information. Um, this wouldn't have happened if they hadn't been holding on to a customer's bank information for a longer period than they needed. Uh, so next, um, the second practice there is controlling access. When it's necessary to collect and store sensitive information, uh, we expect that businesses will limit who has access to it. In my office, we bring law enforcement actions against businesses across the United States. Um, I don't have access to those litigation files because I don't need access to all the evidence. It includes customers' information, um, our, our defendants' personal information about their business practices, and we keep that locked up. Only the team that's working on it and has a need to access it has access. And, and that's a lesson that can be learned. Uh, Gold Financial learned that. That company had failed to restrict employee access to personal information. Uh, everybody in their organization had access to uh, the information on, on file. And as a result, a group of employees were able to transfer thousands of consumer files to third parties. And it, you know, once again, this could have been, been avoided if they had simply restricted employees' access to the files and information that they really had a business need for. Third, we expect businesses to use strong authentication procedures, and that would include complex passphrases, potentially two-factor authentication, and to limit the number of uh, failed login attempts. And the FTC has sued a number of companies for failing to comply with what really is just a very common sense practice. Uh, we sued even uh, fairly sophisticated businesses like uh, Twitter for allowing employees to store uh, user credentials in clear readable text. Uh, we also sued them for failing to suspend or disable uh, credentials after repeated failed login attempts. Um, this is, again, you know, it's very, very uh, common sense practice. My FTC phone, because it has uh, access to my uh, agency's uh, emails relating to cases, if I put in the wrong passcode in my phone or on my computer, um, it's the credentials are, are suspended and, and need to be reset. And it can cause frustration. You know, I, I'm not the best typer on my, on my phone. And there have been times where I put in the wrong code too many times just because I'm clumsy. Um, but, but the offset is really having that um, more secure practices. So next slide. We expect businesses to protect sensitive information, both when it's being stored and when it's in transmission. And we've actually seen a number of businesses, they get it right and they build appropriate security around the data that they're storing, but then they send it in unsecure ways. And so whenever you're sending information that contains sensitive or personally identifiable information, you need to use strong cryptography. We sued a mortgage company for failing to uh, comply with this with this reasonable practice. And in, and there, they actually obtained data from their customers that was encrypted with um, secure sockets layer, SSL encryption. But then they de-encrypted the information and they emailed it throughout their offices and to their partners um, and their, their company headquarters and other branch offices uh, in a de-encrypted state. And that caused uh, you know more vulnerability to their customers' sensitive information. Next, we want businesses to segment their networks appropriately. This means using firewalls and other tools to segment your network and limit access between uh, different computers or different servers. We also want businesses to use appropriate uh, intrusion detection systems and tools to, to monitor for malicious activity. We sue DSW, the, um, the shoe company, the shoe retail stores because they had failed to segment their in-store network. And so as a result, hackers were able to actually get, gain access to one in-store computer 
and through that they could connect to and access uh, computers across the whole enterprise, other stores and, and at the, their corporate headquarters. And you know, although the cyber intrusion may have ha occurred anyways with regard to the one location, the fact that they failed to segment their uh, network uh, resulted in a, a much larger breach and, and loss than, than needed to have occurred. Um, similarly, I think somebody, I, I think it was Ken mentioned that uh, companies often have somebody in, in their network for up to 111 days. Like I think that's a typical length of time that there's somebody is able to gain access and, and say, and card system solutions we sued because they had not used detection systems uh, and they had not identified unauthorized accesses and hackers were able to install programs on their network that collected and trans transmitted customer sensitive data every four days for, for a very long period of time. Um, next, end, endpoint security. We are increasingly mobile. Customers increasingly expect um, uh, faster and more efficient services and, and access to information. And that means we frequently are relying on road, remote access to data. And although that improves efficiencies, it also poses a, a, a security challenge. Every remote access point is a vulnerability and business, businesses need to do all they can to ensure endpoint security. We brought a case against uh, a premier capital lending uh, because they had permitted remote login for business clients so that they could pull consumer reports uh, without really checking the security that these business clients were using. And as a result, hackers were able to uh, steal the credentials of, of their business client and obtain customer reports. Next, and this really applies if you're designing new applications or software programs, they need to um, you know, uh, use secure coding, they need to uh, adhere to uh, platform guidelines, and they need to be, their, their privacy and security features need to be tested. And we've sued a whole slew of different companies. Um, TrendNet uh, didn't have its employees use secure uh, coding. Fandango, Fandango the um, movie ticket uh, app, and Credit Karma both failed to follow explicit platform guidelines re regarding uh, SSL certi certificates. Snapchat touted a number of security measures but never tested them and they did not work as advertised. As advertised. And then we sued guests for not assessing applications for very well-known and common vulnerabilities. Next, and this is something I, I think we can go over quickly because financial institutions are already expected to do this, but keep a watchful eye on, on service providers, especially those that are collecting or handling your customers' information. Um, require them to use reasonable security, put it in writing and verify. And this is already required pursuant to the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. So I expect this is something your, your industry is already very familiar with. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that security is an ongoing process. We do expect businesses to keep their guard up and to reevaluate their data collection and security pro processes all the time. And this means updating and patching third-party software and having procedures. Uh, to kind of find and, and heed the credible security warnings out, that are out there. We sued TJ Maxx Corporation for failing to update its antivirus software, which made them vulnerable to a hack and, and you know, they suffered a, a very significant loss of consumer information. Finally, uh, store sensitive information, regardless of the format that it's in, um, in an appropriate and secure way. And that means paper files, you know, have to be stored in, in physical file cabinets with locks and, and access limited to those who need it. Uh, electronic files and, and uh, storage media uh, need to similarly be secured. We sued LifeLock, a company that I think a lot of people are familiar with, because they failed to keep their paper documents that had consumers' uh, sensitive information and, and they kept it in open and accessible areas. We get complaints, a surprising number of complaints, that businesses are throwing sensitive information into open dumpsters still. So, you know, always think about what information is, is being stored and, and when you're disposing it or storing it or transmitting it, you know, make sure that you're doing that in the most secure way possible. Here, the last, the last slide that I'll cover before turning it back over is uh, a list of resources, and I hope that you'll take an opportunity to go back and explore some of the resources we have available. Start with Security as a guide, Guidebook for Businesses, um, and then we also have a blog series called Stick with Security that talks, you know, does a little bit more of a deeper dive on some of the 
ways to safeguard sensitive information. Uh, so after, uh, if you have an opportunity, check out some of those resources. And then for now, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ken, who has some additional tips and, and ideas. Thank you, Dame. Um, I think uh, if we can go to the next slide. How do we fight back? So the, the amount of information out there with regard to uh, security can be overwhelming. But just as Damon just, just you know um, showed us, we can we can do a little research and go out and find those resources. The FTC, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, is a fantastic resource for small and mid-sized, even large businesses that are looking to apply the techniques that cover um, all aspects of security. And here, three ways to help keep you safe: security is about people, processes, and technology. It's not just about securing your app. It's not just about one tool like antivirus or making sure that you're using Office 365 and their security features. It encompasses everything that you do on a daily basis. It includes your people, it includes the processes they follow, and it includes the technology they use. And that even breaks out further into physical um, security, security architecture, security operations. The bigger a company gets, the more of these uh, type of functions that need to be applied to uh, the security environment. Next slide, please. If, if I can add just one thing to this in, entire um, argument about uh, security is we can no longer trust email as a verifiable mechanism of communication. As Tom mentioned, the first thing uh, you can do is pick up a phone. You can use another piece of technology in your environment to validate identity. So make sure that everybody understands that, um, that, you, that you use your company's email as your primary means of communication. I've seen it too many times where those controls are put in place, yet agents or people in the environment are emailing themselves at home and printing things out because it's just easier because they're incented to get the deal done. We need to incent on the, the concept also of protecting customer information. So this is about training people and making them understand that those are that attack vector of email is very real and it's going to happen. Next slide, please. So the best practices with, with people, and they, these are just a few. Um, and as we talk about people, it's not that people are being malicious. It's not that your employees are going to be malicious. It's that they're going to do something that they are unaware that is malicious. And in most of the cases, that's what happens. It's not an insider who is maliciously attacking your environment. It's somebody that does something um, and is unaware that they did it. So you need to observe and react and be able to react in real time to those issues. Um, never give out passwords. Don't click on attachments without verifying that, hey, that was, that was actually my boss that asked me to, asked me to pay that invoice. Um, do not save information locally. If you do save it locally, make sure you're encrypting your drives. Make sure you're using the latest Windows operating systems that your drive's encrypted, but ins ensure that you're saving off to an environment uh, remotely like a server that can be encrypted, that can be backed up. Um, be skeptical of everything. Be curious about it, uh, and you want to be diligent about it, but be skeptical of everything you communicate with and be hyper aware of the information that's flowing in and uh, out of your environment. The last thing here, hiring a third party to fish employees, it's a, it's, a, it's a low cost thing to do. There's many firms out there that'll do it that will try and test that phishing exercise. Uh, and it will get your, get your users used to these types of emails because they will be more and more sophisticated as you test. And it's a great way to bring your employees up to speed. Next slide, please. So process, creating a culture of compliance and curiosity. So the culture is important here to understand security. We have to move away from, as I mentioned before, we're too small for anybody to care about because we're in this little town. Um, you know, we're a title agency. We're in this little town in the middle of uh, Ohio. Nobody knows we're here. They know you're there. They have your IP address. They're going to scan your environment. And if they find something they would like to take, they're going to take it. So. We all have to operate in a culture of security, understand who's in your environment, who's walking in, who's walking out, and what systems you're using. So the best practices of creating policies and procedures, make sure that your policies and procedures can actually be tested and can be verified. Those are the key things, and we brought the, and they brought that up in the, in the her, her slides. Make sure that not only do we have policies, but that we follow these policies and they can be tested on a regular basis. So educate yourself, train your people, 
uh, complete third-party information security assessments. This is something that can be done um, very inexpensively or you go all the way up to very expensive for any of those people out there that have done ISO certifications, have gone through NIST exercises, COVID exercises. Those are large security assessments, um, but they also can be boiled down into a very simple way to approach security. So don't think that you, with the overwhelming amount of information out there that you need to have a large security assessment. You can do it very streamlined depending on the size of your business. And most of these policies and procedures and best practices can be scoped and tailored to your environment. Next slide, please. So technology, and that's where usually security focuses, right? We first go to technology and we should because that's how we're being attacked. So, so weak pass, using weak passwords or, or storing passwords um, on in a spreadsheet rather than a third-party password manager, ignoring multi-factor authentication for our cloud systems. Um, those are the things that get us into trouble. Uh, we need to be able to stay in tune with these basics. Um, and if we stay in tune with the basics, uh, we're locking our doors, we're locking our windows, we have an alarm system. You're doing more um, and, and you're doing more than the guy sitting next to you. So that's a good thing. When they try to penetrate your network and are looking at your network, if they can't get in, if they can't get that information, they're going to go on to the next one, unless you're very, unless they know specifically what they want from you. So we use these, we use these uh, protective technologies in layers. It's called defense in depth. We don't just use one tool. We use, we train our people, we we modify our processes, and we use the right technology and we test it regularly. Next slide, please. Hardware. Um, this this is an environment. Th this is a a particular topic that can be very difficult for people to understand because hardware is complex. When we talk about routers, switches, firewalls, uh, proxies, um, jump machines, those sorts of in environments are can be very uh, difficult to understand. However, what we want to do is make sure we're encrypting data, make sure we segregate that data, make sure we're using firewalls, make sure we use VPN, force VPN use. Um, don't share devices. Don't allow people to go back and forth, share credentials or devices. And if we can, let's, let's test our environment. Let's test that infrastructure that we put in place with penetration Ooh. testing. So what we want to do as a theme with any of these things is deny by default. Uh, we deny by default and then we um, grant access only where it is needed to, to get the job done. And it is a balance between being convenient and being secure. And more often than not, we now have to choose being secure. Next slide, please. So um, that's a, th that was a quick rundown. I wanted to leave some time for, for Q&A, but that was a quick rundown of what the types of things we can do. I would strongly suggest anybody to look at the tr Federal Trade, inf uh, Trade Commission information, the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, and um, other, other environments uh, like COBIT, um, you can look at ITIL, you can look at a variety of those things and learn and start understanding how those are put together. All right, uh, thanks Ken, uh, Tom and Dama, this is Jeremy. Uh, great insight on, on wire fraud and, and a lot of good tips and advice on, way, on, how, on ways everyone on the call can go about uh, limiting risk. Uh, definitely an important topic. We have over 800 people uh, participate on today's webinar. As we mentioned, we'll hold a little bit of time for Q&A. So if you do have questions, uh, we have had some come in already. Um, guys, I'll just kind of pitch them to you and, you know, whoever wants to kind of step up and, and answer them, feel free. A um, few questions that came in about uh, just protecting the data via email. You know, just sending communications via secure email help uh, thwart this, this from happening. I guess it protects the data from, you know, some title company sending it out, but there's probably not a whole lot you can do to help protect the data from the buyer or the real estate agent if they don't have any safeguards in place. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one, uh, Jeremy. The, and that's the crux of the problem is that you can protect your environment. You can use uh, cloud-based services like Office 365 and take advantage of their um, secure email and all the security features that can come with that. Um, once it leaves your environment, there's no way to control how that consumer is going to interact with that information. So you need to have make sure that you uh, that you have uh, the ability to interact with clients who either can't log into your secure solution or can't receive that information. And then it may it may come down to you can't use email as a transaction process. You need to use some other method. The the the, the you know so. 
that that's that's the tough part of this is that you can protect yourself if the recipient on the other end is not that you're not protecting themselves all you can do is make sure what you're doing is secure and making sure you can you can demonstrate that as a reasonable uh, approach to your cybersecurity. All right. How how you know, maybe you follow up to that is you know how effective do you see multi-factor authentication being you know, in preventing hackers from uh, getting into email accounts? I think the most uh, the most successful um, it's the one-time password. If you've used Google Authenticator, if you've used any of those services, I'm a fan of those. Um, there there can be some sophisticated attacks against them. Uh, I'm not a fan of just using uh, mobile devices and texts for uh, the codes that go out. Uh, but more and more companies now are going to that one-time password uh, model, uh, which I believe adds that additional layer of security. Anything that we talk about putting in place can be thwarted, uh, depending on how sophisticated the actors are coming after you. But you have to keep in mind, the more you raise the bar, the more that it, somebody's going to have to be more and more sophisticated and really want to come after you to get into your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on uh, whether positive pay helps reduce risk? Um, I, I can take that, Jeremy. I think absolutely, but that's that's on the outbound. What positive pay does is that prevents a lot of check fraud because the way that technology and that platform works is we cut a check out of um, you know out of our software. We have to upload that check information into the bank's positive pay registry, and if it's not uploaded, if somebody were to to try to cash a check either remotely or in branch or whatever, if there's not a match in that positive pay system, uh, the check will not go through. And we've had many checks, um, I don't even know how many over the years, at least 15 from around the country that have been presented that positive pay has, has caught. So not only positive pay, but even automated reconciliations uh, that there are softwares out there that do that, that, that we subscribe to, that, that just help drive more insights into the inflow and outflow of, of all the money that we're, that we're handling each month. Um, here's a question from Sasha, and, and Tom, maybe you, you could talk about this one, but this is about recovery of, of uh, fraudulent wires, and the FBI successfully froze the funds, which were not credited to the fraudster's account, but bank saying there's no guarantee or that we might get part of it back um, bank can't just keep it right <laughs> no the the bank can't keep it but the bank also isn't going to just reverse the trajectory of the funds back to you because mm -hmm. they need a window to feel comfortable and actually if you're if you're expecting your funds to come back you're going to have to sign what's called an indemnification agreement or indemnification letter that gives them flyover cover that if they send the money back to you based on what you're saying, because they don't have the ability to, you know, the time to really vet this a lot of times is that you'll make them whole if you're wrong. Um, so uh, a lot of times when money, these are money mules. So you'll wire money, say 300,000 and they're going to, the, the cyber criminal will typically pull out 15 or 20 in cash, and then they'll splinter into multiple different wires the rest of your funds. And that's where you have to move really quickly. We, we published a white paper called When Minutes Matter that is a step-by-step -step recovery um, and also has information on it as well. But there is there is a process that you can go through to, to, to get it out or to get the money back, but you have to move quickly. Yeah, definitely good advice. Time is of the essence. Uh, we will send out a, 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 to everyone, if you didn't get it, a copy of the presentation. So we've had a few questions about that. So uh, just send me an email at jyoey at alta.org. Um, lots of questions coming in. If we don't get to them, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, the speakers. Their con contact information is uh, on, the, on here at this last slide. Um, Question on uh, potential vendors that uh, um, do uh, spoofing tests on on employees. Um, any suggestions here? I, I've got like Security Planner, Fish Me, and No Before. Uh, if you go to Alta's uh, website, you can uh, get contact information for these companies, or you know, email me, and I can get that get that information to you. And any other suggestions? Uh, oh, there's Wombat, who was uh, acquired by Proofpoint. 
So if you go to Proofpoint, they also have um, um, that service. Um, there's some, there, there's probably local ones as well uh, that, that I've worked with that are more local to my market. So they're out there and they come at all different price points. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I think we'll do one more question here and then we'll, we'll wrap up today's, today's webinar again, if we didn't get yours. There are a lot of questions in the queue. So again, feel free to uh, reach out to the, to the speakers. Um, and maybe ever anyone might wants to chime in. This is more on the concern of litigation and costs that you guys, you know, Dana, that you addressed. Um, assuming a fraud occurs on the on the brokers, the consumers' environment, and the title company did nothing wrong, you know, can we get expect to get pulled into corresponding lawsuits? Those hard costs and errors and emissions, insurance premium hikes could destroy title agents' ability to make a profit. You know, just any any more color or thoughts on, on that? I think that Tom covered that really well and, and talked about all the pending liability um, or all the pending cases to determine who's liable. Um, but from you know, from a regulator's perspective, we are basing uh, liability only on a company's own actions, although those actions could be failing to use reasonable measures to ensure that they're partners and, and are using appropriate security. Jeremy, I, I will say one thing about litigation is it's almost as expensive to be right as it is to be found wrong or liable because a, a cost of defense on these cases that are brewing around the country, I'm going to guess would start at 40000 um, if you could get out right after discovery started because they're complex. These are new theories. So uh, what you have to be able, you, you can't prevent somebody, anybody with a laser printer and $300, unfortunately, can sue anybody and make them stand on their feet and defend themselves. So it's not going to solve that. It's just, can you quickly convince the judge that there's no issue of fact, they call it, so you can get out of the thing as quickly as possible and have them look at the other sea of transaction participants that didn't do what you did to protect the customer. So you just need to pass that liability to the remaining participants, because I, I am convinced everyone is going to get is going to get drug in because we know it, and we're just not communicating as well as as we should. And I I believe that's educating the real estate and our lender channel partners to get ahead of how money and communication around money is going to flow at the front end of the transaction, and then just let them know it's not going to change. It's only going to work this way, and it's never ever ever going to change. Yeah, it is. it's a constant effort. Uh, last year at NAR's annual convention, ALTA had a booth there, and our key thing we handed out was the wire fraud infographic just to raise awareness with the realtors, and we couldn't give, give out the infographic fast enough, and we actually have created a portal on Alta's website that allows realtors to access a PDF, again, with information that they can provide to the home buyers and home sellers to educate them about the, the potential, you know, threat of wire fraud. And we're actually, with, with it being Home Ownership Month here in June, we're doing uh, some campaigns, um, online campaigns on, on Google Ads and Facebook, uh, promoting our wire fraud uh, video. And uh, had about 30,000 people view the video so far. So, you know, it's kind of an economical way to, to reach people. Again, you know, with digital online advertising, you can specifically target your demographic. So, you know, if you are a title company in, you know, Columbus, Ohio, you can really narrow that filter and, you know, reach potential people and make, you know, not only, you know, help maybe reduce fraud, but, you know, stand out as, as the expert in your area um, could be maybe a little a more marketing tactic as well. Um, well, guys, I think we'll, we're already almost five minutes past the hour. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up today. Just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded. We'll provide a link so everyone can re can can watch at their own convenience or share with others if they think that uh, it would help help their staff. Because I think this is definitely an education endeavor for for everyone involved. You know, you feel free to forward and, and share with your customers and realtors, lenders as well. Um, looking ahead, uh, next month we will uh, actually dig into cost-effective ways you can reach potential customers uh, through digital marketing, whether it's on Google ads or, or Facebook. Uh, so with that, that would bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, to wrap up, I, I, I need to thank Fidelity once again for sponsoring our Title Topics webinars. And, uh, and thank you, Dama, 
Ken and Tom for taking some time today to help uh, educate everyone on wire fraud. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anytime. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Yep. Bye now.